uh, I think there are few people who, who are unable to log in uh, for today's session. So we can start uh, today. Uh, you will be missing Raja Lakshmi over there. She is uh, attending another uh, program, so she could not join. So we'll start with uh, today's eco session by Dr. Uh, Sonita again um, this week. And we'll be uh, dealing with gastrointestinal symptoms. So we'll start with faculty presentation as uh, she doesn't need an introduction again this week. So the presentation will be over by around 3.40. And then we'll have a discussion uh, on, it, on the topic, followed by a case presentation for another 10 minutes and followed by a discussion after the case presentation. So we hope to finish by 4.30. Uh, welcome Dr. Sunita again uh, for the GI, uh, GI symptoms session. Uh, thanks, Sri Devi, and uh, thanks to Panem India for giving me another um, session. Am I audible to everyone? Yes, yes, very, very well. Okay, uh, so next slide, please. Okay, today I'm hoping. Hello, madam. Power, uh, both the GI symptoms, nausea and vomiting. Uh, I'll uh, so we'll, in nausea and vomiting, I'll be covering uh, nausea vomiting and constipation. In nausea and vomiting, I'll be covering um, the symptom introduction, uh, then assessment of the patient, the pathophysiology, uh, the receptors uh, that is involved when you manage a patient with uh, nausea and vomiting. Then the management and a bit on the research, latest uh, research. Next slide, please. So um, when we deal with the symptom, we need to distinguish there are a few definitions that we need to have in our mind so we need to distinguish between what is nausea what is regurgitation uh, what is retching and what is vomiting so nausea as we all know is it's a sensation it's an unpleasant subjective sensation where the patient has a feeling of need to vomit uh, but might not always end up vomiting and um, it's usually associated with the some autonomic symptoms like pallor sweating salivation and tachycardia next slide please so what about retching? Retching is a rhythmic spasmodic contractions. And um, uh, you know, when we, when, we, when we start with nausea and go on to the process of vomiting, in between you've got this, uh, the mechanical symptom of retching, where there's uh, contractions of the muscles involved, and uh, both the diaphragm and the abdominal muscles will be involved. And that will bring the contents, it causes regurgitation of the contents from the stomach to the esophagus. So that whole process is retching. Next slide, please. And then finally, we come to vomiting, where the, it's a process of expulsing of the gastric contents. And again, uh, the muscles involved are the abdominal muscles in the diaphragm. They cause a forceful and sustained contraction, and they bring the, uh, the contents of the stomach uh, out into the, uh, to the mouth and then ends up in vomiting. Next slide. Um, I've got a slide which shows the, uh, the whole mechanism of, um, you know, of how the uh, process of vomiting is involved. So in this mainly, um, we know about the higher centers. This slide is mainly with the, uh, the process of vomiting, the act of vomiting, uh, which muscles are involved, which, uh, you know, which regions are involved. So as I said, the, the receptors or the trigger of the vomiting comes from the vomiting center. And the vomiting center, it um, sends uh, you know, the, the signals to, first is it causes Cause closure of the glottis, um, then it, it will cause the um, it will cause increase in the abdominal pressure. So the contents will have to come from the stomach uh, to the esophagus and then to the mouth and, and comes out. So it causes the increase in the abdominal pressure, uh, causing compression of the stomach. So stomach is used. Uh, there is something called anti peristalsis that is opposite of the peristalsis. So basically, the peristalsis the contents goes down. Here the contents has to come back up. There's anti peristalsis, there's increase in the abdominal pressure, and the stomach is used, and then there's the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter. So, once the lower esophageal sphincter relaxes, the contents come from the stomach to the esophagus. After it reaches there, we've got the closure to the glottis, and then uh, it comes straight out of the mouth and it comes as a cascade of vomiting. Where everything starts from the higher centers. The receptor trigger starts from the higher centers via the vomiting center. Next slide, please.
So why is it important? Why do you have to deal with nausea vomiting uh, in palliative care? So the incidence of nausea vomiting as a symptom is about 20 to 30 percent of all the patients with advanced cancer can have nausea and vomiting as a symptom. And when they reach the last weeks of life, it becomes more common. So it's 70 percent in the last week of life. And, um, and we also know if you've learned about morphine and the, uh, you know, the in management slide, you know that 30 percent of patients who start on morphine can have nausea vomiting during the first week. Um, and uh, what are the other conditions? What are the common cancers again present with the uh, uh, with the symptoms? We've got advanced gynecological cancers, about two percent of them. Advanced stomach cancer, thirty-six percentage, and advanced is twenty percentage. Next slide. And uh, again, why is it important for us to know about it? One is that it's, it's a common symptom. And the second one is this is one symptom, uh, which if not controlled, can cause a poor control of the other symptoms. Because all medications that we, that we use, uh, including pain medications, we go by oral route. We all know that. We prefer oral route to the other parental route. So when there is a, uh, when there's nausea and vomiting, most of the medications that we give by oral route will not be absorbed properly. So thereby, uh, the other control, uh, other symptoms will also will also not be controlled. Um, then, uh, because there's in decrease in the oral intake of food and fluid, it will contribute to the weight loss and fatigue, which leads to further leads to dehydration and hypokalemia. Um, also, uh, we would have noticed that if patients are on other medications like NSAIDs or ACE inhibitors and diuretics, when the patient develops nausea and vomiting, you further complications because of that. It can be a side effect of all these medications. And on top of that, the dehydration and hypokalemia will worsen if these patients are on uh, such, such medications and that can lead to renal failure. Uh, it will also, also have some negative impact on the family and carers looking after patients. Next slide. Uh, and the entity that we need to remember is regurgitation. So uh, it's usually seen when there's, a, there's an obstruction to the esophagus. So the important thing to uh, distinguish between is that it's important to differentiate between regurgitation from vomiting to avoid the delay in seeking endoscopic intervention if it's appropriate. Dr. Sunita, your voice came down. Can you speak a little bit louder? Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So regurgitation, uh, it's important to distinguish between whether when the patient complains of vomiting, we need to take a proper history to know whether are vomiting the contents or is it gastric regurgitation that is coming up so basically regurgitation means usually when the um, you know if, if you think it's regurgitation sometimes you can in endoscopic interventions if it is appropriate um, and then the history to remember is uh, it is not related by antiemetics so um, the if the patient has got persistent nausea and then followed by regurgitation it can respond to appropriate medication so regurgitation the whole uh, uh, you know the whole cascade of vomiting will not be there basically the contents in the stomach just regurgitates in, into the esophagus um, you know in between and, and they come out um, as you know it, it doesn't come out forcefully it just regurgitates and comes out so they still be uh, typically different and um, it usually in the lower esophagus pain just cast uh, cast number that can happen and sometimes endoscopic interventions uh, may be appropriate uh, if the symptom is more of regurgitation rather than um, vomiting. And if you give antiemetics, the symptom might not be relieved. And it's usually because of the obstruction of the esophagus, so standing is more appropriate. Next slide. Uh, it's important. This is a bit, um, the, uh, you know, the thing to understand about nausea vomiting is the all the uh, the receptors that is involved. And once we have an idea of the receptors and the idea of the various vomiting regions, it's uh, and uh, you know what are the causes of vomiting depending on the different regions, it might be easy to understand the medications. That is why you know we always pay more attention to this, uh, you know, the, the the vomiting areas and all. So the mainly the neural pathways of nausea vomiting is. Um, it's managed by three zones. We've got the chemoreceptor trigger zone or CTSL. We've got the vomiting center and we've got a medullary antiemetic tone. Next slide. Uh, it's across the brain where you can see where the um, chemoreceptor trigger zone is um, in, the, in the brainstem. And near that there's an area prostremia. Uh, we've also got the medulla oblongata. So all these are quite nearby. Uh, and the signals come from one center to the other. So the three most important ones are in the brainstem. So you've got the CTSN, which actually is in, uh, in the uh, base of the fourth ventricle. And then we have got the, uh, the middle oblongator and the vomiting center. Next slide. 
So uh, uh, CT is located in the area posthuma in the floor of 420. Uh, important thing to remember is there is no blood brain barrier. So when there is no blood brain barrier, you know that the, uh, the chemicals can sort of uh, diffuse into the brain. And that is why the, the me metabolic causes of nausea vomiting are usually because it triggers the CTSH zone. So uremia, uh, the drug induced cause of nausea vomiting, are when they uh, uh, stimulate the CTSH zone. And um, again, the, uh, when, how the steroids act as an anti emetic is when it, um, you know, it is anti inflammatory effect, which actually decreases the migration of the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the chemicals to the, through the blood brain barrier. So that's how steroids also work there as an anti emetic. The receptors to remember here is the dopamine D2 receptors and the 5ST3 receptors. Next slide. Uh, then the vomiting center, you remember the picture, it's also located, it's located in the medulla. Uh, the neural pathways from the CT, so the chemoreceptor trigger zone, uh, goes to nucleus, tra tractus, nucleus of tractus solitaris and the reticular formation in the medulla oblongata. The receptors here, one is uh, histamine H1 receptors, acetylcholine receptors, and 5 uh, hydroxytryptin 5-HT2. So um, depending on the receptors, wherever the receptors are, the medications, when you come to medications, you, you'll be able to connect the receptors and the medications together. And you'll know that which uh, medications act on which receptor uh, and thereby connect the cause of vomiting and the, uh, what medications to use for that. So that's the importance of learning the receptors and medication. So vomiting center, we've got histamine receptors H1, acetylcholine and 5-HT2. Next slide. Uh, the third, third uh, postulate is about the medullary neurons. Now the research is still ongoing on this theory and it's just, uh, it's, it's not, um, it's just a uh, theory that has been hypothesized that en encephalogic pathways involved in the medullary neurons and uh, it causes inhibition of the anti-emetic tone of the medullary neurons which potentiates. Basically, these neurons will increase the action of the CTSH zone. And um, displacement of encephalins from the receptors by naloxone or opioids may reduce the anti-emetic tone and when you reduce the anti-emetic tone it can um, as uh, it can increase the uh, action of ctsh and also inhibition of encephalic synthesis by chemotherapy so this is a it, it is posted that it is via the medullary tones uh, also that the uh, chemotherapy causing uh, you know nausea vomiting and the naloxone opioids maybe it's, it's posted that it also acts via the medullary neuro the thing to remember is that will affect the ctsh tone and that's how it, it causes now uh, vomiting Next slide. Uh, further, there are a few other receptors also postulated. One is in cerebral cortex. We've got GABA receptors in cerebral cortex and also the mechanoreceptors in the meninges. So um, the GABA receptors, uh, basically, you know, uh, when, the, when, when the symptom is not responding to any, any of these conventional antiemetics, we can use... Uh, Diaspins. So sometimes you can give lorazepam and clonazepam for intractable nausea vomiting. You can also use that for anticipatory nausea vomiting. So some patients on chemotherapy who's had chemo in the past know how bad the symptom is. When they're due for the next cycle of chemo, they'll start feeling nausea, nausea you know, prior to the day of chemo. So that's something called anticipatory nausea vomiting. And um, for that, we can give benzodiazepines and they act via the GABA receptors in the cerebral cortex. The other one is the mechanoceptors in the meninges. So, um, you know, in conditions of raised intracranial pressure, so in this uh, space occupying lesions of the brain, raised intracranial tension, that will stimulate the mechanoceptors is positive, uh, causing nausea vomiting because of raised ICT. So these receptors are in the cerebral cortex. Next slide. Then we have also got the vestibular system, um, which uh, probably you're more familiar with, so motion sickness. Uh, and uh, in middle pathology and all. So you've got acetylcholine receptors and H1 receptors in the vestibular system. Next slide. Uh, coming to gut, um, uh, so the, uh, the receptors that is directly on the gut and cerebral surface Vistra. We've got 5 ST receptors, acetylcholine receptors, and the H1. So uh, things like um, you know uh, increased uh, gastric uh, distension, gastric motility, uh, bowel obstruction, all these can st directly stimulate the receptors in the gut and the visceral surface in the viscera via this. Next slide. So 
So, um, so that's about the uh, neural pathology and the receptors. Now, how do you assess a patient uh, who comes to presence to you with nausea and vomiting? So as I mentioned earlier, we need to find out the separate history. We need to find out exactly what's happening. So you have to ask a separate history for nausea and vomiting, uh, like things like triggers, what is the volume, what's the pattern, uh, are there exacerbating and relieving factors, um, including the individual or combination drugs that's already been tried? So sometimes you've got uh, worsening symptoms in the morning, sometimes worsening symptoms throughout in a, towards the end of the day when the contents of the stomach gets accumulated. Have they tried any anti before? Has that worked? What routes have they tried? What is the normal bowel habit? And any other medication that has been recently started because that itself can cause the symptom. Next slide. Uh, what do you examine the patient for? So you take a proper history, then you examine the patient. What all do you look at the patient? Uh, look for general dehydration. Uh, again, examination-wise also, you can find if it is causing, um, if there's any cause for nausea vomiting, so there's infection going on. Look for signs of sepsis, uh, signs of toxicity. Examine the central nervous system. So think about um, meningitis um, causing nausea vomiting based, uh, you know, a stroke based in that little tension. Abdomen, uh, bowel obstruction, look for organomegaly. Because uh, increased uh, hepatomegalic and cumbrous stomach can cause uh, vomiting. Bowel sounds, again, for bowel obstruction. Look for succussion splash. Next slide. Then, uh, how do you investigate the vision? Or what all do you look for investigation? So, again, uh, think of all the causes of nausea vomiting. So, uremia can be one of the causes. So, you look for uh, urine electrolytes, hypercalcemia. So, calcium level you can check. Um, hypokalemia causing paralytic ileus and uh, causing bowel obstruction. So, you can look for that. Liver function test, hepatic encephalopathy, jaundice itself can cause vomiting. So, you need to do LFTs, calciums, calcium, blood glucose. So, it's hyperosmolar, look for blood glucose level. Uh, and again, dip the urine. If there's any possible infection. So infection can cause uh, osteomitis. So dip the urine for possible infection. Next slide. Um, how do you manage the patient? Um, always try and correct the correctable. So for the first thing to remember is rather than giving any, any sort of anti when the patient comes with the symptom, find, try to find the cause of the symptom. And then if there's any correctable um, condition, then try and correct it. So if it's renal function, give some fluids, so that'll get better. Try and correct the hypercalcemia. If it's constipation, give laxatives to correct that. Um, try with non-pharmacological measures um, and then um, anti-emetic is appropriate to the likely identified cause. So one thing to remember in palliative care is whenever we deal with the nausea vomiting, we always try and find the cause and we try and address the management according to the cause. So anti-emetic that is specifically for the uh, cause identified. So choose the anti-emetic anti accordingly. Sometimes we need to use a combination of anti-emetic. Anti so you start one that's not working, then add another one. And, and sometimes a broad spectrum anti can be indicated if multiple concurrent factors are present. Next slide. Uh, what are the non-pharmacological methods? Again, correcting the correctable. Oral care and hygiene is very, very important. And regularize the bowel habit. Uh, so when you have repeated episodes of vomiting, if you look at the um, oral, uh, oral condition, the tongue will be coated, will be very dry, probably has foul smell, halitosis. So oral care and hygiene is very important. And also try and regularize the bowel habit. Next slide. Um, how do you advise the patients? So we be still, if it's uh, if it's a contraindication from the surgical point of view, saying that they should be strictly be nil by mouth because of bowel obstruction, we probably might tell them to be nil by mouth. But uh, I, but usually we ask them to have regular, small, palatable portions rather than large meals of food. So uh, if the symptom is going, then we advise them to take small meals and to take it quite frequently, but not like large meal at a time. Um, sometimes the food preparation smell can trigger the symptoms. So avoid food preparation cooking smells. Try and manage the patient in a calm, reassuring environment. Uh, acupuncture, I must have mentioned acupuncture in my last presentation. So acupuncture um, has an evidence even in, in nausea vomiting. So uh, in the wrist, is a, uh, in the wrist has got the point for acupuncture for nausea. So there's some bands that are available called acupressure bands called C-band, which you can apply over the uh, wrist area to help with the symptom. And acupuncture, you can refer the patient for acupuncture if they are happy with that. Next slide. Um, 
the new the non pharmacological management you minimize or discontinue the offending medications uh, distraction uh, visualization relaxation techniques uh, can help um, especially with the patients who has got anticipatory nausea vomiting and anxiety when they uh, you know when think about chemotherapy sometimes music therapy has an evidence um, and uh, control other symptoms so controlling pain and also address any social psychological and spiritual issues um, can also help with the management next slide now this is one uh, single slide which um, you know if you can remember will help you um, a lot in the management so it it um, if you look, you look at the slide basically it's all color coded all the red ones um, that is written number one are the receptors in the various regions we've covered all these regions so uh, this slide has is a summary of everything in there so the red ones are the receptors uh, the one that's written in red are the receptors the number two that's written in blue are the causes causes um, you know which acting on different areas and uh, acting on the various receptors and the one in green are the medications so if you start from the vestibular system so on the top so you've got red one the receptors i mentioned before the histamine and acetylcholine receptors what are the causes of nausea vomiting um, which actually particularly uh, vestibular system you've got motion sickness opioids sometimes act on that acetylcholine receptors basal skull tumors can also cause vomiting through the vestibular system and then also understand the vestibular system also will come to the vomiting center and then it causes say, you know the vomit and then which is the drug we've got antihistamine cyclosine uh, i think available in some parts of the country uh, cinerazine all those can act stemetil that is west plus system then coming to ctz primorosorter trigger zone which are the receptors you've got d2 5 t3 and nk1 nk1 is um, uh, i'll mention that later on so it's neurokinin one recept uh, receptors uh, the, what are the causes uh, which can cause ctz so i said ctz is near the blood brain barrier so uh, Uh, drugs metabolic and toxins that will penetrate the blood brain barrier and cause vomiting so what is that is the drugs metabolic and toxins are in the ct set and what are the medications that will uh, cause i mean act via this receptor so if it's a metabolic cause of uh, nausea vomiting you go for haloperidol metoclopramide and apropitan apropitan is the one that is a newer one which acts on the nk1 receptor new one for chemotherapy now um, so these three are the medications which acts on these receptors then gi tract we've got two types so we've got a prokinetic one receptors and the uh, the one with which activation vagal nerve leading to uh, ms so 5st4 and 5st3 are there so one is one cause of gi causes gastric stasis so um, if the gastric stasis is a cause of nausea vomiting via the 5st4 d2 receptors we need to give a prokinetic to prevent that so you give either domperidone or metoclopramide which is a prokinetic now uh, the other receptors other mechanisms via the visceral and serosal causes causing uh, in an nausea vomiting where friend is 5st3 and acetyl choline so you give cyclosine to slow the transit so in bowel obstruction with colic if the patient has got bowel obstruction and there is means like a total bowel obstruction total uh, obstruction then you can't give a prokinetic in that case we give something to slow the gut down and there cyclosine will act um, subacute bowel obstruction so you, you can also give buscofan hyoscine butyl bromide to slow the gut down So those two are the gastrointestinal tract ones. Then uh, the cerebral cortex I mentioned. So you've got GABA and the H1 receptors. What are the causes? It's pain, fear, anxiety, and raised endocrine pressure. They haven't mentioned the benzos there as a drug, but obviously with GABA you can give benzodiazepines acting on GABA receptors and um, cyclosine. Uh, and cyclosine is the, is the medication you can give. Uh, then they all come to the um, vomiting center. uh and vomiting centers you've got further receptors like h1 acetylcholine 5 ht nk1 and mu uh so uh the causes uh, directly on vomiting center you can have raised icp and intestinal infiltration the drugs are cyclosine and levomepromycin levomepromycin i don't think is available in india but that is a broad spectrum anti emetic that we use in uk um it covers all the receptors and apropen for the nk1 i think there's a chat that came slides not uh not clear may need may need may need some more focus i didn't understand that probably she needs a we'll share the slides and see yeah is it the okay, next slide. slides that clear i don't know whether the concept is uh, what she means i don't know uh, can you just uh, like uh, we, we can see the slides very clearly we can continue okay next slide 
So I've, I've uh, divided the management depending on the cause now. So if it's a me metabolic or biochemical upset, um, what, what will be the clinical picture? The clinical picture would be like patient with present with persistent or severe vomiting, and uh, there is little relief from vomiting or etching. So if it's a uh, if it's a gastric stasis problem, they vomit. you vomit, you you might have some relief with that. But um, in metabolic or biochemical cause, the nausea vomiting is a persistent uh, symptom, and there isn't much relief from vomiting or etching. And as I mentioned before, the site is the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Uh, CT is it, and uh, what are the causes? So it can be either drugs causing that, and uh, carcinomatosis or chronic inflammation or metabolic causes. And treatment, as I mentioned before, Reperidol is a drug of choice. You can also give metoclopramide 10 mg four times a day, and obviously levomepramycin. So patient, um, if a patient comes to you and you think it's a uremic cause of uh, vomiting, or if you think it's a drug induced, so it's morphine induced vomiting, uh, or any uh, then you can either give haloperidol or metoclopramide. That is how we go with the cause of vomiting and the medication. Then mot motility disorders. So how does a patient present with motility disorders? You can have intermittent large volume vomitus and um, uh, that means gastric stasis. So the, uh, you know, the, uh, the contents come out and the symptoms get relieved one after the vomiting. You can also have some early satiation. Uh, you can have reflex and uh, hiccup. And often there's little nausea until immediately prior to vomit. It's like projectile vomiting. Patient wouldn't have any nausea. Um, and then suddenly they vomit a large amount of vomitus. Uh, what are the causes of that? You can have because of gastric stasis, outlet obstruction. Now the gastric outlet obstruction can either be pseudo obstruction or it can be proper intestinal obstruction. And uh, this can be caused by... A your voice is it can be any autonomic neuropathy like paranoia. Uh, uh, so autonomic neuropathy of the of the uh, you know the muscles and the nerves. That shall I continue? Your voice is breaking now. Okay, I think it's something wrong with my connection. Now it is clear. In between, it was not. Is it any better now? Yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, autonomic neuropathy, um, paraneoplastic drugs, metabolic causes, hypercalcemia, uh, mechanical obstruction, tumor nodes, enlarged liver. So I mentioned when this hyper, hyper, uh, you know, the um, hepatomegaly can compress on the stomach, leading to squash stomach. That is also cause uh, one motor disorder. So what do you give for that? So one that is directly acting on the uh, the gastric, um, you know, so that so you can give metoclopramide 10 to 20 mg QDS. Um, and uh, when we give it to a syringe driver, we can give a higher dose. So uh, PCF says that you can go up to 90 milligram, 80 to 90 milligram over 24 hours subcut infusion metoclopramide. You can also try domperidone 10 mg TDS, but that's oral. Um, and then uh, erythromycin is also uh, some has got evidence based as a proton prokinetic. So that the antibiotic erythromycin we can give us a proton prokinetic, but uh, 250 mg QDS. If there's an extrinsic compression of the stomach uh, by uh, you know by tumor from outside, you can give steroids. So dexamethasone, 4 to 8 mg daily, and reduce after three days, or you can also use a stent. These are the how we manage motility disorders. Next slide, please. Intracranial disorders. Um, so how does a patient present with that? You can have headache, um, symptoms of headache, altered conscious levels, vertigo, dizziness, or movement-related uh, sickness. And um, what is the site? So it can be either raised uh, intracranial pressure because of the, you know, the cortex stimulation or vestibular nerve inner ear stimulation. Uh, what's the cause of that? So it can be a space of lesion, ICSOL, or base of skull tumor. Uh, can also be autotoxidian midlayer problems. So we mentioned H1 receptors. So cyclosine is a drug of choice. Um, if it's not available, you can go for hyosin, hydrobromide, um, or hyosin butyl bromide. Again, intracranial tumors, dexamethasone, dexamethasone, Uh, I think we lost you, Dr. Samantha. Uh, we can't hear anything. Uh, 
Sridhivi, I'm just trying to, I'm actually in the telemedicine hall and I'd expected them to come and lock me on, but nobody came on time. So I started with my data. Now okay. somebody's there, I'll try and see if I can get a better connection. Yeah, okay, sure, just sure. give me five minutes. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, I'll see whether I can get uh, back on the um, other one. So I'll continue with this one now. Um, then, uh, so coming to gastric esophageal irritation, um, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you can have constant uh, nausea, uh, symptoms will be constant nausea, worse on eating, and a patient can also have reflex symptoms and a gastric colic. The reason is a stimulation of vagus. So we mentioned about two, two causes of gastric. One is the direct stimulation vagus, the other one is a motility disorder. And what will can cause that? So you've got tumors, um, toxins, inflammation, uh, infection like uh, candida, um, herpes simplex, and um, foreign body can cause extent. So how do you manage that? Um, so vagus, you can go with hyacinth, hydrobromide, 150 to 300 microgram. Uh, you can also buy a syringe driver, or you can use a patch. Um, you can use uh, ranitidine. 150 milligram twice daily. It's a proton pump inhibitors. And um, the thing to remember is, if there's esophageal spasm, sometimes spokane agents can trigger esophageal spasm. So um, it's better to avoid that. Um, but uh, if there's no not much, then you can go with uh, proton pump inhibitors if there is uh, symptoms of gastric reflex and gastro call. Next slide. Then last one is the factorial cause. So we, we do everything. We still can't find a cause of uh, uh, nausea vomiting. And, uh, you know, high, as I said, higher centers are involved of pain, fear, and anxiety. Then it's multifactorial unknown cause. So the site is unclear. Um, then you go with uh, a broad spectrum antiemetic. So you can use either levomepromacine, um, which covers all the receptors. Again, steroids can be used for that. Eight, dexamethasone, 8 milligram daily. Reduced after three days. Aim to stop. Uh, then, if it's a higher center of origin, so pain, fear, anxiety, uh, we use uh, benzodiazepines like lorazepam, 500 microgram, uh, to uh, those can be increased to 1 mg, and diazepam, 2 to 5 mg. So, benzos can also be used for that. Next slide. So, uh, some principles of management. So, I hope that is clear now. And uh, you know, if you had more time, I would have put some MCQs in between uh, so that you could you'd be able to answer that. But um, that's a general idea of how to manage. Uh, the other thing to remember is, um, as I mentioned, steroid and benzos have a role in intractable nausea vomiting. So not as a first line uh, antiemetic, but there's intractable nausea vomiting. You can use steroid and benzos. Um, the thing to remember is cyclosine and other anti muscanic drugs. So, drugs like hyoscine, butyl bromide, buscopan, and cyclosine are anti muscanics that will block the final common pathway through which metaclopide acts. So, they both antagonize each other. So, you don't um, give them both together. So, if you're giving cyclosine, then if you give metaclopide, then both of them together won't work, or that will just antagonize each other. Uh, then, uh, if you're using a syringe driver, cyclosine and buscopan can crystallize. So, be careful when you use them both. Uh, also consider the route of administration. So if the oral route is, uh, does not provide adequate of other route. So if it is in the hospital, we can think of IV route, but at home probably we'll go for the sublingual route. Uh, sorry, this lingual and the uh, subcutaneous route. And the thing to remember is all our medications that we have discussed here can be given by a subcut route. And usually if, the, um, if there is intact 
asthma or severe vomiting, um, it's better to start them on a syringe driver. So continuous subcutaneous infusion of these medications. And you can even give combination medications. So you can also give morphine and metoclopramide together, halopidol together to manage uh, combination symptoms together. And that works better rather than giving it by oral route. Next slide. Uh, a word about the NK, NK1 or neurokinin receptor antagonist. So um, it's a newer one. It's an adjuvant for the treatment of um, uh, in a chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting. And uh, it's currently been uh, used for nausea vomiting associated with the moderately and highly emetogenic uh, chemotherapy. And uh, for adults, uh, the dose is initially 120 milligram. Dose to be taken one hour before chemotherapy and then 80 milligram once daily for two days. Consult the product literature for dose of the uh, dexamethasone also and 5-HT. So basically, you, we all know that on dance set the 5-HT antagonist is the drug of choice for uh, the uh, it used to be the drug of choice for uh, chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting. So this can be given along with that. So if it's not settling with that, then this can be given along with that. It's not worth it. In the end, so apropitant uh, initially 125 milligram uh, and other, other varieties are forced apropitant and uh, roll apropitant and uh, new to pitant. Those are the other new varieties. Next slide. Uh, one word about the 5 ST and receptor antagonists. If you remember from the um, the slide which showed the um, you know all the receptors and the drugs together, the uh, the the map, the ST, they haven't mentioned 5 ST in that. But it, we all use this probably we are all using this the first time on dancetone or MSC is something that has been used very very common. But it is initially uh, initially licensed for chemotherapy induced nausea vomiting. So you've got on dancetone, you've got palonestone. Some uh, on call is using palonestone. Pronoun, and then it's in hand as a patches. So when you sit down, um, you can a patch. You can apply 3.5 milligram of 24 hours, a uh, seven-day patch. It's also available as oral IBN subcut preparation, but it's very expensive compared to ondansetone. Ondansetone is a conventional emicid that is that we give for chemotherapy. Next slide. Um. And the word about the octreotide or the somastatin certain analogs. So initially, the octreotide is, um, has been licensed for carcinoid tumors with the, uh, zoom, zoom. with uh, features of uh, in a, a carcinoid tumors with features of carcinoid syndromes, BIPOMAs and gluconomas. Uh, it uh, it's also been used in conditions where there's increased intestinal secretions in palliative care. So octreotide is used to reduce intestinal secretions in palliative care, uh, reduce the vomiting due to bowel obstruction in palliative care. And how do we get that? We can give it by again syringe driver, continuous subcutaneous infusion. Um, so for bowel obstruction, uh, trials have been done to. Uh, one minute, okay. Here's an end breather. I'll just try and log in from the other computer. Six two eight two nine Hello, can, are you, can you hear me now? Voice is too low. Voice is very low. Can you hear me? Voice. It's not the network. The voice is very, very low. Very good, Amitya. Uh, now we have told that is clear. Yeah, so, Devi, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Clear. Yes. Very good. Very good. Very Thank you.
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I see. So you use uh, uh, the, uh, the Okay, cool, okay, cool, is it clear? It's clear, it's clear. Am I, am I audible? Yes. Yes, okay. yes. I thought, yeah, that's true. Thank you, sorry about that, Sri Devi. Uh, so next slide. Okay, so this is um, one paper about the research. So we all know that uh, what are medications we're giving in, uh, you know, palliative care, we don't have much of an uh, you know, evidence-based medicine or we don't have direct research done on that. This is a recent study done. It's a randomized open label study of guideline-driven antiemetic therapy versus single-agent antiemetic therapy in patients with advanced cancer and nausea not related to anti-cancer treatment. Uh, next slide. So what they've done is uh, it's a randomized uh, prospective open label trial, and um, and what they've done is um, studies used for readily available antibiotics in accordance with the etiology based guidelines. So um, the the idea was to so as I said that we have to go with the etiology based guidelines. So whatever the cost of the vomiting, you give the medication. But the, in this trial, what they did was one arm they just give blind halopital for all the patients, and in the other arm they give according to etiology based guidelines. And what they found was that etiology-based guideline directed approach to antimity therapy with offered rapid benefit. So they, the, the, the score was that for those who completed the treatment each day, a greater response rate was seen in the guideline arm than the single agent arm in 24 hours. So first 24 hours, uh, if you go with the guideline-based treatment, uh, you had a better response or better imp or improvement of symptoms. But after 48 to 72 hours, the, both the symptoms were the same, as in the response were the same. So they, what this uh, concluded was that the etiology-based uh, guideline-directed approach to antimetic therapy is of a rapid benefit, but in longer term, a single agent treatment was with halopetal was in, enough. So basically, halopetal was sort of like a broad spectrum there, and that was covering almost all the all the all the symptoms. So um, if you don't have any other antimetic relief for halopetal, then that's fine. You can still manage the symptoms. Next slide, please. So uh, quickly mention the practical consideration. So look for hydration, the nutritional status of the patient, uh, nausea, maybe the cause um, of lack of efficacy of other antiemetics and other oral drugs. So think of that. Uh, it could also be a refractory treatment. Um, and when the uh, symptom is refractory to treatment, you, you have to think of benzodiazepine because sometimes the symptom can be refractory to treatment. Um, then uh, prokinetic agents can trigger you know, esophageal spasm. So be careful about that. Next slide. Uh, if the patient is appropriate, it's always you can, can consider sending the patients for intervention radiological stenting can be an option. Um, and um, if there's upper bowel obstruction, if, again, it's, if it's appropriate, sometimes you have you can ensure, you have do procedures like uh, putting an asogastic tube followed by placement of a venting gastrostomy can be preferable to the persistent vomiting. And uh, patients might accept a facial vomit or a pattern of daily vomiting when it's not accompanied by a continuous intermittent nausea. So sometimes people find it difficult to manage or live with the nausea, but uh, they're okay with the vomiting. Some patients find that they're okay with the vomiting. So patients might accept an occasional vomit or pattern or daily vomiting when it's not accompanied by the continuous intermittent nausea. Next slide. Um, advice to patients and carers, again, relaxation can help. Um, continue to take the pain medication because severe pain can worsen the symptoms. And always uh, try and eat small portions uh, more frequently rather than less frequent large meals. And plenty of fresh air can be helpful. Next slide. Uh, concentrate on oral hygiene, oral fresh. Um, and um, it, if the uh, healthcare professionals, informed healthcare professionals, if the vomiting is interfering with the care of wound dressings, bed sores, and um, uh, ostomy appliances, also look for dietary advices and um, and take the uh, in, uh, look after dietary advice and take the antiemetic medication regularly and follow the instructions. Next slide. Uh, take home messages. It's another common symptom, and proper history and evaluation is needed. And uh, treatment should, should be targeted to the cause. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide, Next slide please. So again, um, I think I'll do this very quickly because I'm running out of time. Next slide. 
um, what is constipation? Um, the, the criteria for research purposes, constipation is a, um, you know, the symptom should be lasting for at least three months uh, of straining during at least 25% 20, defecation. So this is our own criteria for gastrointestinal research. And th there should also be a sensation of anorectal obstruction during at least 25% of the defecations or lumpy or hard stools at least 25% of time or fewer than three bowel movements per week. So this is the criteria for research. But what we say is constipation is passage of small heart feces infrequently and with difficulty. Uh, next slide. Or it's too hard, it's too small, or too infrequent, or, or decrease in that normal frequency. And I've also put here a Bristol stool chart. Uh, you know, a nurses, uh, usually nurses do with that, with, with where you have the type one stools, which is very quite hard and lumps, and type seven stool, that is diarrhea, entirely liquid. So that's how we describe the stools. When it's too hard, it's too small and too infrequent, or there's decrease in the normal frequency. Next slide. Again, it's an important symptom. Why is it important? It's very, very prevalent. In the general population, at least 10% will report the symptom have constipation. Uh, highest prevalence is with, with the older age and female gender. Um, physical illness is a risk factor for constipation. So how do we know that physical illness as such is a risk factor for constipation? When they did a study on uh, elderly patients who were admitted to hospital and the same age group at home, but they found that 60% of the elderly people who were in hospital were found to be constipated as compared to 22% of the same age group living at home. So just the, uh, you know, the, just the uh, process of getting admitted to hospital has made them constipated. So that is a, uh, because they've got an illness, that's why they got admitted to hospital. So physical illness is a risk factor for constipation. Um, and uh, even if you look in the evidence for oncology and palliative care, even in palliative care, there is an indicate treatment of constipation because it's a poorly addressed symptom, poorly asked for symptom and poorly addressed symptom. Next slide. Uh, just a brief mention of the normal intestinal physiology. So the gut contents are uh, about, uh, it takes two to four hours in this small bowel. And in, 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 when it comes to larger bowel, in colon, it takes about 24 to 48 hours. So in colon, there is, uh, you know, it shows episodes of forward peristalsis, um, resulting in mass movements of the gut contents. And um, the principal neurotransmitters that is involved in the control of peristalsis are the acetylcholine and the VIP. And it's important to know because how does the um, you know, opioid receptors expire the acetylcholine and cause constipation? So what normally happens is about 7 liters of fluid is secreted into the gut each day. And uh, to which we also add at least 1 point liter of dietary fluid. And when it comes to the end, the, um, the water, water, as it passes through the large bowel, the water is gradually removed from the, from the contents. And it comes and it becomes uh, like a normal soft feces. But when the excessive water is removed, it can cause, uh, water removal can cause heart stools. Next slide. So uh, this is like a vicious cycle. So there's old hardened feces accumulated in the bowel. And uh, when there's accumulation of the, um, of the condensed in the bowel, the diameter of bowel is efficiently reduced. At that point of accumulation, it is the diameter of bowel is efficiently reduced. So that means when the diameter is reduced, the time taken for the feces to pass is increased. So when the, we all know that when the diameter of a tube is reduced, whatever time the same amount has to pass, that time is increased. So um, that leads to the efficiency of the bowel will be reduced, and then that leads to constipation. And then it goes on to a vicious cycle. The stools become harder, and again, it accumulates. So we've got this enlarged and dilated rectum at the end. We've got the anus, this chronic constipation. There's the anus, we've got the enlarged and dilated rectum. And this large amount of stool there. On top of that, we've got the stops, uh, the soft stool, and then the more stool gets accumulated in the back passage and it goes back in, into the colon. And that's where we get overflow diarrhea. When the hard stool comes out, we get the watery and the soft stool contents coming out. Next slide. What are symptoms when the patient presents with constipation? You can have flatulence, bloating, abdominal pain. And there'll be a feeling of incomplete evacuation. At least you'll be passing a small amount of feces. So you still have got a feeling of incomplete evacuation. Next slide. Uh, when it comes to complications, so that, that is symptoms of constipation. But when it goes into complications, you can have anorexia, overflow diarrhea. I mentioned overflow diarrhea. So basically constipated and then you remove the obstruction of the constipation. Patients have profuse diarrhea. Uh, that is not diarrhea or loose tooth. That is overflow diarrhea secondary to constipation. Then in elderly people, you can have confusion and delirium. Uh, when, then you can have nausea, vomiting. Also have uh, urinary retention, urinary dysfunction. And uh, sometimes can lead to hemorrhoids and anal fissure. Next slide. Uh, 
uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so causes of constipation, it can, uh, it can be either caused by cancer. So how do, how do cancer cause constipation? Because of uh, one is hypercalcemia and hypokalemia can cause constipation. When the disease is inside the abdomen, it can press on the, um, in the bowel and cause, because the abdomen pelvic diseases. Sometimes the cancer itself can invade into the nerve. So it can be neural plex, plexus invasion because of the cancer. Spinal cord compression, we all know that's an emergency and uh, that can press on constipation. Cauda inquina syndrome and depression in patients with cancer who are depressed can present with constipation. Next slide. Uh, if it's with debility uh, because of weakness, the patient, because of the palliative patient, they're weak, inactivity, or bed rest, but there's poor nutrition, poor fluid intake, confusion, you know, leading on to forgetting to go on time and they're confused, inability to reach the toilet. Some elderly people uh, in care homes, they're not able to reach the toilet on time or they just, you know, just stop going. So that can cause constipation. Next slide. Caused by treatment. So drug induced constipation, you've got a long list of medication. The one that we always remember or have to remember is opioid because we are causing constipation by giving opioid. Even add other medications also like cyclosine, ondansetone, other anticholinergics, antispasmodic, subascopan, and some antidepressants can cause antacids, NSAIDs, diuretics, and iron. So there's a list of medications when, uh, and there are lots of medications that we also commonly prescribe. Next slide. Opioid disconstipation, again, commonest cause of constipation are patients. Uh, it's more prone. I mean, invariably, all the patients will have uh, opioid. If you start them on opioid, they will have opioid disconstipation. It's more prone in mobile patients. Um, there will be reduced reduction of the forward peristalsis, the moment the gut is affected. And this reduced sensitivity to rectal distension. There will be slow passage of feces and increased absorption of water and electrolytes in the small and large intestine. Next slide. How do you assess a patient? Uh, always ask the normal bowel pattern because some people might not be having a daily stools every day. So that, that might, be, might not be their normal pattern. So always assess the normal and the current bowel pattern of the patient. So ask the frequency, the consistency, ease of passage, um, the, this blood present, are there is a pain and passing stool or not? Ask about the current laxities and any laxities as previously taken. Uh, look for clinical features, um, so pain, nausea, vomiting, and drugs. Hello? Hello, madam? Sudhir, madam? Yeah, I can't hear. Dr. Sunita? I think she lost the network again. Yeah. Sudhir, madam? Next slide. Yeah. We lost you in between. Okay. Palpate the abdomen, um, uh, look for a sleep palpable colon with uh, indentable and mobile or rarely tender fetal masses. And a tumor mass is to heart, but not uh, indentable. So um, when we palpate the abdomen, we all know that fetal masses are, are soft and uh, mobile. But if it's tumor mass, it should be very hard. Next slide. Rectal examination is a must. If a patient comes with constipation, you have to finish with the PI examination. Look for heart stools, look for any tumor masses or hemorrhoids and anal fissure or any peri perianal ulceration, that is uh, any local causes causing the constipation. Next slide. Uh, again, uh, always do, don't forget spinal cord compression. So if the neurological deficit is suspected, a full neurological examination is uh, essential because constipation can have a spinal cord compression. So you look for sphincter tone and rectal sensations, so anal tone and the rectal sensation. Next slide. Investigations, um, if possible, if, you, if you're able to, you can do a plain, plain extra of abdomen. We can see that the clumps of rounded masses can be seen uh, with the entrapped gas, and you can sometimes see varying degrees of dilated bowel. Can uh, you know? Um, so that's that's called chronic constipation. Next slide. Prevention is better. So explain the reason to the patient, especially tell the patient if you're starting an opioid that it can cause constipation to take laxatives. Adequate fluid intake. Uh, fiber is good. Uh, check about constipating medication, laxatives with opioid, and you can also try laxative combinations. Next slide. Uh, how do you classify laxatives? So you've got um, a stool softeners and the stimulant laxatives. The stool softeners include the bulk forming one, the acercular, middle cellulose. 
lubricants like liquid paraffin, mineral oil, osmotic laxatives, uh, lactulose, and the surface wetting agents like the doxyl sodium and the polyoxama. And the other classes of stimulant laxatives like the bisacodyl and the senna. So these are the group of laxatives that we formally use in our clinical practice. Next slide. So there's a, there's a rough management ideas. Um, so if you, if there's an option, option A of laxity choice would be, um, either you start with the stimulant first, especially if you're giving opioid, always start with the stimulant laxity first. And if it's still not getting any better, you add a softener to it. So option A is a, a stimulant plus or minus softener. So you can give, give a, a senna, like 15 to 30 milligram of bisacodyl tablets. And if still becomes hard, then add in softening agent like the deposit sodium. At the significant calling of course, stimulant should be discontinued and softener used instead. So the, the problem with stimulant is it can cause colic. So if colic is there, then stop the stimulant, but just use a softener. Option B is you can go for osmotic laxatives, lactulose, um, uh, and uh, in, in case of uh, hepatic encephalopathy and liver problems causing uh, constipation, or to prevent encephalopathy, we always go for lax lactulose. Then if option A and B have been unsuccessful, then we progress to option C, but there's a rectal treatment. So you can give either suppositories enema, you can use a manual rectal evacuation, retention enema, you can also use a lateral lavage and high up enema with a 45 centimeter suction catheter. Next slide. Uh, if it's impact is soft, when you do a PR examination, if you think if you get impact is soft faces, then you can use peractal stimulant laxatives like uh, suppository. So the cycle 10 to 20 mg suppository. And in, in which case, it's important for the suppository to have the contact with the rectal mucosa because it stimulates the rectal mucosa and uh, in causes the uh, evacuation of the bowel. Next slide. Um, so, pancidomberis, constipation can present with atypical symptoms like nausea, vomit, uh, abdominal distension, resting with diarrhea, always as good, overflow diarrhea, and tied to the dose of laxatives according to response. Uh, in opioids, the uh, thing to remember is methadone and fentanyl are less constipating than morphine. So, when you're switching to op opioids, probably you have to reduce the dose of laxatives. Uh, osmotic laxatives can cause red blood imbalance in the long term and rescue enema suppositories and constipation for more than three days. Next slide. Uh, again, advice about the oral fluid intake at least of two liters per day. Uh, ensure that the patient has privacy and access to toilet facilities, especially in elderly female patients. That's very, very important. Footstool to elevate the knees. Encourage daily exercise according to their ability. Address any reversible factors contributing to constipation. And laxatives should be tightened according to individual response. So, um, you know, all patients won't, won't need the same dose. So change dose accordingly. If current regimen is unsatisfactory and well tolerated, continue the same regime, but review the patient regularly. Uh, and uh, always use oral laxatives if possible in preference to alternate route of administration. Next slide. If it's a paraplegic or bed bound patient, um, we all know that they can present with constipation. Uh, so sometimes we need to give um, like a bowel regime for this patient. So sometimes what we use is we give alternating laxatives and loperamide. So that is one of the possibilities. You give laxatives and if the patient, in case they develop into diarrhea, then you give loperamide to actually um, settle that down. Or you can, you can avoid all the laxatives and you can give them a rectal intervention. So you can uh, prescribe uh, you know, the suppositories every one to three days to avoid possible infection, resulting in fecal incontinence and anal fissures of both. So that is one way of managing paraplegic or bed bound patients. Next slide. So a final word about opioid induced constipation. We, what we normally use is we use a conventional, uh, you know, laxatives for opioid induced constipation. And some people it works, um, but in some people it might not work. So there are two medications that is licensed for opioid induced, specifically for opioid induced constipation. Uh, and these are peripheral opioid antagonists, which which will relieve constipation, but uh, but actually doesn't affect the pain. So they're methyl naltrexone and naloxidol. Only be used for opioid induced constipation and other specialists advice. And it's also, it's contraindicated in GI obstruction or patients at risk of GI perforation. Next slide. I've mentioned the two uh, doses there. I'm not very sure whether it's available. Uh, I haven't used it in India, but it's, it's given there. So if it becomes available, if it's available, you can use it. Methyl naltrexone is restricted to use in opioid constipation patients with advanced illness. And we give it as a subcutaneous injection according to the weight of the patient. Naloxidol is an, again the same thing. Uh, it's a tablet, 25 milligram daily in the morning, reduced to 25 milligram in moderate to severe renal environment. It's not recommended in severe hepatic environment. Um, and um, what, this, what this suggests is that when you put the patient naloxidol, you have to stop the maintenance laxative therapy until the clinical effect of naloxidol is determined. 
Next slide, please. Okay. Um, so, uh, practical aspects, um, you know, always review the laxity regimen when you switch between different opioids. And um, if there's a clinical push of obstruction with colic, uh, then you have to avoid stimulant laxatives. Um, bulk forming laxatives, we all know, um, you know, uh, you need to mix with the, a lot of fluid. So the patient is, it's not suitable for patients with poor fluid intake. And also sometimes if there's um, like things like um, heart failure, sometimes you have to reduce the uh, amount of fluid. So that it's not, it's not advisable for such patients. I think we are, I think we are nearly end, yeah. And lactose is not effective without high fluid intake. It can cause platelets and abdominal cramps in some patients. Next slide. Okay. Well, that's the last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunita. I know that, that this topic is very... Yeah, I think topic. I did. I, you I usually did, take it in a day. Yeah, no, yeah exactly. I, I did mention that probably we should cut it. Uh, last time also I took the same topic and it's very, very rushed. So maybe in the future you should divide it. Yeah, I think we should split it into uh, two topics. Two maybe topics, constipation, yeah. constipation and bowel obstruction can be one day topic yeah. and nausea exactly. vomiting for one day because yeah. uh, we generally take a day for all the yeah, yeah. so exactly. really tough for the faculty to finish it all on time. I I I did I hide lo hit lots of slides till I was not able to you know stop anyway. And uh, to the participants, I guess everything is there in the slides. If you just rush through the slides, it's very clear with pictures and uh, boxes. So it's very clear. And even if it is a one-day class, there will be a lot of questions in the head. Yeah. Receptors and all, they are not clear at all. Even after many years and months of practice, yeah. we always go back and look at the receptors and stuff. So uh, don't worry about the whole confusion. It is. It will be there even if it is a one-day session. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So We still do uh, that. So. <laughs> yeah, with yeah. practice, you will get to know yeah. how to play with the receptors and drugs, I guess. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sundita. I think we'll go on to the case presentation yeah. directly, so in between we can uh, incorporate uh, any, any discussion. Uh, Dr. Carolyn is doing the case presentation. Yes. Can we start the case presentation? Vishnu, can we show the uh, presentation? Wait, ma'am. Hello? Yes, uh, Sister Carolyn. Uh, Vishnu, will you uh, show okay. the slide from here? Okay. Uh, good evening to all. I'm Sister Caroline, working in Holy Cross Hospital at Vellodu, Dindukal, Tamil Nadu. We got 30 bed hospital. We mainly admit patients for the addiction. We also care patients with general conditions. Yes, for the case presentation, I have taken 24 year old female who's diagnosed at the moment. Can I please, wait, please wait one minute. Hello. Uh, yes, Vishnu will uh, will be uh, showing the presentation shortly. Yeah. Today he is uh, doing everything together because Rajalakshmi is not there, so he is managing both uh, laptops from there. Okay. Yeah. Start. Yeah. Okay. Next. Slide. For the case presentation, I have taken twenty-four year year old female who's diagnosed at the moment when all the problem was started was acute appendicitis which was complicated to her pregnancy. Later it was found carcinoma of intestine with metastasis but the primary cancer site was not diagnosed until her death. Okay. She came with a complaint of epigastric pain lasting for four hours and the pain was shifted to right leg posta for about two hours. She also had fever, nausea, vomiting and constipation. History of illness. Uh, sister, just tell Vishnu uh, to change the slide because he doesn't understand when to change. Just tell okay, next Okay, next, next slide please. Okay. History of illness. She was married at the age of 19. Within a year, she, she, she had a normal vaginal delivery. And after, after the first delivery, for about three years, she had problem of irregular menstru menstruation and uh, one missed abortion. For that, she went to, when she visited a gynecologist, she gave her Ecosprin, Dufastron, and Folate. No test were taken to confirm pregnancy at the first visit. But two weeks later, she came to me with the complaint of nausea, vomiting, 
and when the urine pregnancy test was done it was positive then i referred her back to the same gynecologist she did an ultrasound it, it was confirmed 11 week pregnancy she took back all the medicine and she gave her folate and pedoxin uh, tab and now and then she used to come to me with the same complaint I, I I also gave her period oxygen and IV fluid, but within a month she developed. She came to me with the features of typical acute appendicitis. Next slide, please. This is next. Okay. Per abdominal examination, abdominal distension was there. Subumbilical, palpable uterus, 14 week size. Guarding and muscle rigidity noted over right iliac fossa. Rebound tenderness was present and was confined to right iliac fossa. Bowel sound was present. Now, she was normally built, her height 150, weight 50, but history of weight loss 9 kg within 3 months. She was febrile, temperature 102. That time she, she was she, she had tachycardia. No signs of icterus. Cyanosis, finger clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or edema. All her vitals were normal except tachycardia. Next. So her in the investigation was done. HB10, all other blood investigations were within normal limit. Ultrasound showed acute appendicitis with the anechoic collection in right iliac fossa. And all screening tests was within normal limit. Next. So emergency appendicectomy done for perforated appendicitis on for the same day in a tertiary hospital. With after three days, ultrasound done, it showed hepatomegaly, evidence of left pleural effusion, evidence of obvious omental omen stiffness over the right para umbilical segments. For patient was discharged on 7th post-operative day and asked to go for dressing on daily basis. So the uh, nurses were doing the dressing. Actually, the doctor who did the surgery didn't see the wound after the discharge. post appendicectomy, 10th day, she came to me with a complaint of severe abdominal pain, abdominal distension, wound gapping, and oozing from the surgical wound site was noted. At that moment, I, show, I showed the wound to the surgeon who came to us as, as a visiting doctor. He had a doubt and he was telling me that can be a malignancy or um, TB abdomen. But the um, biopsy result was not with them. This is a summary, the pathology report was not available and the caregiver or the patient was not aware Sorry, next next slide, please. Okay. This is a summary histopathology report was not available, and the caregiver, that is her husband or the patient, were not aware whether the specimen was sent for biopsy or not. Then I referred her back to the hospital where surgery was done, requesting for the treatment and discharge summary and for the biopsy report. But the madam, or the gynecologist, gave a reference letter to the surgeon who did the operation. So they went and saw the surgeon and he saw her, saw them on the OPD, advised to serum amylase, ESR, ultrasound abdomen. So they, that night she came to me with the same complaint of severe abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, and then symptomatic treatment given and sent for the ultrasound. And the ultrasound showed Normal indirectly gestational uh, fetus, moderate acetus, hepatitis plenomegaly, gallbladder sludge. Next slide. Yes, mixed echogenic inflammatory lesion in right hypochondrium and right paraumbilical region. So they uh, suggested MRI. And the sonologist inquired biopsy result from the hospital where surgery had been done. They told they should get it from a particular lab, and the madam inquired the lab, but they haven't received tissue for biopsy. So she advised them to go to Madre Chigas. 
Okay. The next slide. Okay. So she was admitted in GH Madurai, but as soon as she was admitted, of every doctor who met her uh, inquiring about the biopsy report. So the, her husband had a hard time. She had she had to go to the hospital and to the lab, going here and there, but she couldn't get the biopsy report. And then within a four day, four days after, there uh, there was a spontaneous expulsion of the fetus. And the emergency laparotomy done on 24th for guard guarded perforation with the biliary peritonitis, omental deposits in order. Biopsy taken, so did metastatic carcinomatous deposits. MRI done, then uh, it showed possibilities of liver secondaries, peritoneal deposits, evidence of ascetic fluid, free fluid in abdomen and pelvis. Next slide. And severe pleural effusion, they are noted. Evidence of enlarged multiple para aortic lymph nodes. Patient, by the time patient developed a severe pain, vomiting, unable to swallow anything, breathlessness, restlessness, and sleeplessness. Then chemotherapy and palliative care started. She developed breathlessness due to massive pleural effusion of the right lung. ICD done. But she, uh, but she went with a multiple organ failure. Patient was not willing to continue treatment in the GH. Even though the severity of her illness and the prognosis was not communicated to her, she realized that she's not going to live longer. So she was compelling her husband to take her home. So he brought her home trying to fulfill all her wishes. Sudden discharge from the hospital and a long journey home made the situation worse. She became more breathless and she was brought to our hospital. Next slide. So the medication, chemotherapy started in Madurai, GH. And when she was coming to our hospital already, she had developed multiple organ failure, breathlessness, and she was very weak. And though we have started with the, this, this medicines, I couldn't, I couldn't get the IV access. So, because her body was swollen and uh, um, anemic, and she was breathless. So, uh, psych uh, psychologic, and she could spend three days and 12 hours in our hospital. May she could spend time with her loved ones. Psychological, emotional, and spiritual support given. Patient died of respiratory and multiple organ failure on 24th 9, 2018. Next slide. Psychological aspects. She, her husband, her four-year-old ch girl child, and her father-in-law lives together. Her husband goes to her mother in, in his younger age. He is the only breadwinner to their family. He was very loving and caring nature. Her father died of fear column one year back. Her mother stays with her younger brother who is addicted to alcohol and cannabis and is irresponsive to her family. She and her husband were giving full support to her mother, both financially and emotionally, while her father was seriously ill in the hospital and at home. And they continued to support her even after the death of her father. She, was, she had faith in God, but while she was suffering with illness, she desperately said, if God is a loving God, he must grant me a favor. He must allow me to live longer as a good wife to my husband and a good mother to my child. Next, next slide, please. So main concern for her was fear of death. She wants to live. So I, I could feel her, the pulse, her pulse. So she was, from the very beginning, she was fighting with the death. She wanted, she had a longingness to live. And another concern was her worry about the future of her child and their husband who will take care of them in her absence. Actually, uh, towards the end of her life, she was entrusting her responsibilities to her loved ones. She was um, telling her husband to marry her, her relative and entrusting her ma child to her mother. But the husband was not willing to marry another girl and 
also the ch child was very um, always uh, going along with her with her husband because this 50 days of her illness in the hospital uh, during that time her husband had to go uh, to the hospital to her home two uh, hours uh, journey so all the time the child was depending on her on the, her husband so by the time the towards the end of her life she had a, a kind of a relief that a husband will take care of her child abdominal pain and breathlessness surgical wound was another concern and then unable to eat eat and from the very moment of her illness always she count the date every time she used to tell me uh, 10 days 20 days 30 days i haven't e taken anything so she was feeling like eating um, vegetable biryani and so many um, favor favorable dis dishes but uh, she could not able to eat anything her husband used to bring her but she smelled it and she gave to her back because whatever she drinks, um, uh, she had a, a greenish kind of vomiting and uh, uh, bad with the bad smell. So she had a cons the, that was unable to eat, unable to sleep, unable to do her daily activities. So 24 year old female had an emergency appendicectomy for perforated appendicitis on 4th. 8, 2018, following which abdomen distension from 10th post-operative day, spontaneous expulsion of fetus on 24th, emergency laparotomy done 20, on the same day, uh, gallbladder perforation with biliary peritonitis. Omen deposits noted, biopsy taken showed metastatic carcinoma deposits. Chemotherapy and palliative care started in Rajaji General Hospital, Madurai. She developed breathlessness due to massive floral effusion, right lung, ICD done. She came to us for palliative care on 20th. She had a peaceful death on 24th. So discussion points. Is it a case of medical negligence? Uh, whether proper communication was done between doctor to doctor, doctor to caregiver, and doctor to the patient. Is there any possibility of saving her life if we could have diagnosed earlier? And since she and her father died of colon cancer, her husband is anxious of her daughter getting cancer. If there is a chance how to prevent and relieve him from anxiety thank you thank you mr carol i know that it was a very difficult situation for you all because of a lot of issues including the age small child lack of yeah. uh over to you dr sunita uh, i i know that most of the points are not related to gi symptoms so probably if you want we can focus more on the because she has she had symptoms of uh, like symptoms like pain and vomiting unable to but you can just uh, go through these points if possible yeah it's a very very difficult case um, i don't know what to, what to actually say and i don't know i mean um, i mean i'm glad that you were able to give her at least uh, four days of good palliative care and she could die in, uh, in peace. And I think some, at the end of the day, sometimes that's the only thing that we can do. We're quite helpless in this whole situation, I know. Um, yeah, I don't know about the medical negligence part, but I think if it's a, such a bad colon cancer, which looks like I've metastasized anyway, probably you know, knowing it at that stage wouldn't have changed much um, yeah, as far as the management is concerned. Um, you know, uh, and uh, obviously proper communication uh, should have been there. Maybe the casing of the first biopsy results, even though that told us this routine appendicectomy, it could have could have been chased up uh, initially. So hindsight is always good. So we could say unable to understand, unable to hear. I'm saying you know probably chasing up the biopsy result um, could have been done initially, if possible. Uh, you know that was on the, because they must have thought it was a benign. Uh, condition and they didn't suspect malignancy so that's why it was not picked up um, but symptom wise I think uh, it, the main symptoms was probably pain and uh, I think main symptom was the psychological distress that she was having because she didn't want to die so um, you know I, I don't know how, how if you can if you just uh, go to previous slide Vishnu uh, how did they manage the symptoms 
what was given to manage the symptoms? Actually, there is a slide on medications, uh, list of medications. So you've given some anti-emetic, emeset, uh, pandopasol, uh, so severe pain, vomiting, unable to solo anything, breathlessness, uh, sleeplessness, um, dexamethasone, keftriaxone, tramadol. So it looks like you haven't used morphine. So I'm presuming that the pain was better with tramadol and you didn't have to go to morphine. Um, again, tramadol is only given BD. So I think in a different scenario, if, if the, the infusion is possible, I would have put it on a syringe driver with uh, morphine and um, a bit of anti emetics of perinome um, and maybe midazolam because it looks like she was very, very anxious. So you've given a lorazepam uh, sublingually, but obviously you can add midazolam also with the driver with like, proper end of life care managing and give a lot of you know, spiritual support. Um, and the, at, at that point, she was starting to question the fact that God is there, but why is she dying, a young lady? Which I think anybody would do that. So maybe in, in, your, house, in your place, you would, have, you would have been able to give a lot of spiritual support. And I think that's what you know, she needed at that point. Um, yeah, nothing else for my part. Mr. Carolyn, is there any other question from your side? We can't actually comment about the medical negligence part. Uh, I think we should uh, start thinking about what we might have missed. I, and I don't find anything that is major missing because you have uh, taken them to your place, given a quality time during last few days with the child and with the husband. And a lot of meaningful conversations have happened. That's why you could explain it so much. So a lot of conversations might have happened. Yeah. Uh, beginning when she was coming with the uh, problem with the nausea and vomiting, uh, we are all focused on the uh, pregnancy. Okay. Uh, so that was the main thing uh, we, we focused on. Then may, maybe uh, whether it was due to uh, bubble obstruction, uh, we don't know. Uh, she was telling me when the first for the first pregnancy she didn't have any vomiting and nausea and everything but even then i was telling her for some mothers you know and the, for the first pregnancy even for the second pregnancy some some mothers will have hyperemesis gravida or like you no know, we we uh, we was uh, uh, in a way taking in that way but uh, we don't know whether it was due to her the problem started nearly enough, we don't know. Even when she was telling, she reduced about 9 kg. That was the time she had ideal weight. Okay, so we didn't much, uh, even that time she didn't able to eat anything. So we took it in that sense. Okay, uh, this is due to pregnancy. Everything we consider due to pregnancy and we wanted to uh, save her child. We even when, when, she, when we were preparing her for the surgery for the appendicitis, we were uh, uh, more concentrating on the, uh, the child, uh, safe, safe of the child. But uh, uh, maybe uh, if, if they would have uh, sent for biopsy result, maybe uh, within five days, the result would have been come up. But uh, there, some mistake had happened. Um, um, but lately, it was about 20 days after only, uh, they have done the laparotomy. So within that time, whether if, if, is it because after the appendicectomy, we see developed more uh, severe seriousness, we don't know. If you would have saved it, that's what I thought, if you know, uh, find out earlier, maybe we would have saved a life or we don't know. That's what I wanted to so know was the, uh, How was the appendicectomy done? Was, was, it, was it some laparoscopic appendicectomy or something? They no, had an open, 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 open. Sir, open. So, I don't know, when, when sometimes surgeons open it, um, are they able to understand if it's like a, a medical incident is spread? Some people are able to identify, right? I don't know whether... Yeah. And the other thing is, as you said, seeding of, if it was a medical tumor, then maybe seeding must have happened when they did the surgery. So that yeah. would have caused the, uh, you know, to become, come back as a florid. Thing. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Allow, uh, that's a possibility. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I don't think there is nothing wrong like uh, in missing out the symptoms because all these symptoms are very much related to pregnancy. So anyone, yeah. uh, anyone would have uh, done the same uh, because we never relate that uh, this to even the weight loss. Obviously, we suspect nausea, vomiting, and then weight loss and okay. pregnancy. Um, and, 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 yeah. 
uh, he is this a familial problem see her her father had also um, uh, fe colon uh, it was diagnosed lately and then she we could not save uh, they could not save his life also but uh, um, is the the now the, uh, the last question what i put was because uh, the her husband brought her child when, when the child comes with the a problem of abdominal pain he has so much concern now uh, not to get the child should not get uh, cancer so he was uh, he was just carrying um, food which cause cost, uh, cost uh, um, cancer cancerous things he wanted to know how to prevent the child that uh, thing. How, how to advise him I mean, I think uh, if you can refer the, uh, the family for genetic testing, I'm sure uh, yeah. the colon cancer gene testing can be done. And I think the child should be tested. I think it's, it's right for him to worry uh, okay. because it looks like there is a genetic link there. That's why in such a young age, if she developed colon cancer, it's likely because of some genetic thing going on. And there's a fam strong family still. So definitely, I think they can get it tested. Okay. Thank you, madam. Any other questions from the participants? Yeah, it is very sad to hear that it is very young age she passed away. It's a very acute illness. And uh, she had a weight loss. During pregnancy, the weight loss will not be so high as uh, as you have said, maybe two, three kg they may reduce during the first trimester. After that, they usually pick up. The other thing is, maybe pregnancy also caused a little faster progression of the disease because it is an immunocompromised uh, state during the, the pregnancies. Uh, uh, poor has spoken now. I don't know who it is. Uh, it's shown as Lenovo PC. Uh, can you tell me your name, sister? Yeah, Annie, Annie. Okay. Okay, I'll show my Vishnu, name. please note that that is Dr. Annie because when you yes. put the attendance, okay. then you may need the name. Hmm. Okay, ma'am. No and uh, Sister Karen, I was thinking, uh, was she comfortable during end of life? Uh, was it like good pain relief and uh, she has pleural effusion, so she had breathlessness also. And... Uh, what were the symptoms? Could you control the symptoms during end of life? Uh, please unmute yourself. You are muted. Hello? Hello? Yes, sister, please. We can uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, 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 during the end of her life, when she came to us, she was. She didn't complain much about the pain and the vomiting. Also, she was uh, very weak and she could able to talk uh, till her death. But uh, uh, her body, she could not move and she could uh, not do anything. Breathlessness was there, and uh, she was uh, talking in between. Sometimes she get dis uh, disoriented, like sometimes. But uh, full of the time, she was talking. She able to talk. Uh, sister, is it uh, the inability to talk is due to breathlessness? But she had breathlessness, but uh, even then she was talking. Breathlessness we, uh, was the when she came itself, she was she couldn't be able to uh, talk, communicate. But uh, lately she developed talking. Even the last day she talked, she was talking. She was able to talk a little. So maybe one thing uh, maybe uh, we, we can suggest would be about morphine uh, as Dr. Sunita was rightly mentioned. I would like you to just make a short comment on uh, morphine. And okay. Dr. Sunita? Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, so uh, breathlessness and morphine. Um, uh, 
Uh, so morphine is very useful uh, for bed lessons. Uh, I think if, if the pain is not a major issue, then you can start lower dose of morphine. And again, I would go for infusion, uh, even though she is like awake and talking. Uh, it's better to give it as infusion. You can have a continuous thing in the background. So you can put 5 mg of morphine uh, as a subcut infusion. Um, and you can actually miss that with a 10 mg of midazolam and um, a 5 or 10 mg of midazolam and uh, in a bit of um, uh, for vomiting. So you're getting a halopidol, so she, she, won't, she won't be distressed and uh, she won't be vomiting also. So those three will do the trick. And with 5 of midazolam, she'll still be awake, but it should actually calm her down and she would be less anxious. And breathlessness would help with the morphine also. So probably that is something that we would have done differently if you, had a, you, know, if you were managing her. And this is, this is actually going for 24 hours. So it's an infusion where you put 5 mg morphine. Um, uh, so that'd be, that'd be 5 ml. Plus medicinal 5 mg is 5 ml. And then a halopidol 5 mg is 1 ml. That's the ampule size. Then you add, just, just as you add a uh, normal line to it. So you mix them all together in a, in a syringe, um, in a pump, and then you give it over 24 hours. So you start infusions where the whole thing goes over 24 hours. Depending on what sort of infusion pump is available, you can do that. Uh, GH, we don't have any pump uh, in the hospital. So what they do is they put all this into a 500 ml dextrose bag and they just uh, adjust a drip rate so that it goes over 24 hours. So in either way, total amount of drug should go over 24 hours as a subcut route. I'm telling the subcut doses now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunita. And I think we have... Uh reach the time and I know that the sessions were like uh, she had to really rush through the session it's not her problem it's a session the topic is so big that uh, she has to rush anyway so please go through the slides and maybe from the next module next uh, session onwards we'll split it into two just nausea and vomiting for one session is more than enough I, even that will not be finished in 40 minutes I guess mm -hmm. Uh, so please go through the slides. If you have any queries, you can write to us if there is any lack of clarity in the slides about the receptors and centers. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sunita, uh, for the session again. And we'll see you again for another equal session. Okay. Thank you, Sri Devi. Thanks, Dean. All the participants, please uh, click the link for feedback and do it now before you log out. Otherwise, you'll not find time to log in and do it again. Thank you so much, uh, all, for attending.